I got an email once a number of years ago from somebody to say that they knew my password and they actually mentioned what my password was, which was quite an old password. They said, I know this is your password. If you don't get in touch with me and pay, that they would release videos they had of me and pictures that they'd taken from my webcam. And I know what you get up to in front of your webcam, all that sort of you know insinuations. But what worried me initially was the fact that they had legitimate information about me in some way. Um, but I contacted the, I think I contacted the police actually and said to them, you know, should I be worried about this? And they said, no, we recognize that as a scam. We hear all the time about people being fooled by online scammers. You fall for a fake email or click on a link that looks legit, but isn't. I've done it, even though I like to think of myself as world weary enough to tell the difference. But even as we all become more hardened against any kind of request for our information, the scammers are coming up with more sophisticated ways to steal our identities and our money. And no surprise, they're now getting a big helping hand from, you guessed it, artificial intelligence. The financial industry is a prime target, and banks are struggling to protect customers. Bloomberg's Nabila Ahmed and Adam Haig in Sydney have been reporting on how AI is transforming financial crime and what we can do to stay one step ahead. They're running a business too, and they're going for maximum profit. And unlike the banks, they're not bound by rules and regulations. So they're able to move a lot faster. And that's why the banks, it seems like they're just a step behind and trying to catch up. This is an arms race of technological innovation, really. And if the scammers are one step ahead with the technology, then they're going to continue to keep winning. I'm Wes Kosova. Today on The Big Take, artificial intelligence, real money. Adam, in this story that you and Nabila wrote with our colleagues Ainsley Thompson and Ellie Harmsworth, you talk about how artificial intelligence, AI, is changing the way people are falling victim to scams. And you talk in your reporting about this concept of social engineering scams. What exactly are those? I think this is just kind of like another element of how AI is gripping this change that we're seeing in scams and, and fraudulent payments. So social engineering is is kind of just another way to phrase what's happening in the way that they're getting access to people through the multitudes of different ways that they can do that. So one of those is, is coming at you directly through Facebook and WhatsApp and those kind of places. But really, the next level is how AI is being used to essentially replicate people who may be close to you in your lives. So they can pretend to be someone that you know, and they can use that as a way to kind of play on your emotions and, uh, and be able to get access to your money and your funds. Your identity essentially feels like it's no longer safe, especially once you've been out there either talking or, you know, everyone has a voicemail message that can be used to get a realistic interpretation of what your voice is. As the example with the fake masks and how they're used with the 3D printing to create fake IDs, like it shows that you just got so much information out there on the on the internet through all sorts of social media platforms that we all use and everyone uses on a day-to-day -day basis. Nabila, we've had phishing scams for a long time where someone will pretend to be someone you know or somebody in your email phone book even starts emailing you and you kind of know it's not them. How are these different? The US Federal Trade Commission, which has been really trying to look into this space and protect consumers, has been saying that AI is being used to turbocharge fraud. And that's what we're seeing here is that artificial intelligence is being used to clone people's voices, to make it sound like them, to really refine these attacks. In the case of the ones where people are calling up, say, I'm calling you pretending to be your child, and I've actually downloaded their voice from the internet, mostly from social media accounts. A lot of people now have open public social media accounts, so it's very easy to get snippets of people's voice. They only need about 
20 to 30 seconds. So it's not very much. And they can put it through a synthesizer that you can buy on the internet, or you could even get free ones where it allows you to clone that person's voice and gets it to say whatever you want it to say. So we've had cases where children ringing up their parents asking for money or saying, you know, I'm stuck, I'm on a school excursion, I'm, the bus is broken down, I really need money to pay for an Uber or pay for a taxi, whatever, please, can I have that money? And in that moment, when you hear your child in distress, it's very hard for the target of these scams to decipher and to stop and think, pause and think, is this really my child? Are they really in trouble? What should I do here? How widespread a problem is this? How many people are getting scammed using these new technologies? It's hard to tell how many are getting scammed using the new technologies. We know that the number of people getting scammed and the amount of money that people are losing is just going up and up and up. For example, in the US last year, consumers lost about $8.8 billion, which was up 44% from the year before. Of those, the investment scams are some of the fastest growing ones, but AI is being used in all kinds of different scams. So it's really hard to pass through exactly, you know, what percentage of scams are using AI, but we just know that it's a new tool that's available to fraudsters and they're using it in more and more innovative ways. What are some of the most popular scams, like ways of extracting money from people? So one really good example that we got from one of the banks that we were talking to, they had a customer who lost about $750,000 through one of these investment scams. So this was a guy who had worked in finance, who was coming towards the end of his career, and he decided that he wanted to do some of his own investments. And he took a lot of his money and put them into a bond fund. You know, it's meant to be safe and it was pretty good yielding. And he found this fund on the internet. So he he did a search engine search, a Google search, and it popped up with this particular investment company. It looked pretty legit. And as he looked into it more and more, and remember, this is a guy who worked in finance himself. So he's a little bit familiar with the language. So he looked at the site. They had regular prospectuses. They had updates. They would send him quarterly updates talking about how his investments were doing. And it was showing that it was going really well. So he kept investing more and more. And it was, I think, a year or two later when he went to actually withdraw that money and cash in on his profits that he realized that it was all fake. And Nabila, one of the ways where AI is used for financial fraud is to simply make investment websites that look exactly like the real ones we use. That's exactly right. You know, we are all familiar with ChatGPT. If you type into that, that you want to have a prospectus written for somebody that works in the financial industry and write it from the perspective of a financial investment firm, it does a pretty good job. It actually does a pretty scarily good job. (laughs) So AI is being used to really refine the language and refine the look and feel of these prospectuses and financial updates so that investors find it difficult to figure out what's real and what's fake. So what we're really seeing is that AI is being used in many different areas of scams across the spectrum, which includes all sorts from romance scams to voice scams, where they take your voice and pretend to be someone else, Um, ID-based scams, where they're taking another form of, of ID, such as your face, and pretending to be you. And you talked about how much this is costing consumers. What about the financial institutions that are also getting scammed when all these accounts are being hacked? More broadly, when you look at cybercrime costs, which includes scams, they're set to hit $8 trillion this year, which if it were a country, it would be the third largest economy in the world today. By 2025, the projections are that it will reach $10.5 trillion, which would mean that they would have tripled in a decade. So there are some staggering numbers here. And Microsoft put together some numbers for this story that we're working on. And I'm just going to reel some of them off here because they're just so incredible. 
22 billion is the number of records stolen by hackers in 2022. Uh, 1,287 is the number of password attacks per second in the world. Just think about that. 1,287. 56 is the average number of days between the time a scammer infiltrates your system and that infiltration is detected. 72 is the minutes, the median time for an attacker to access your private data if you fall victim to a phishing email. 500,000 is the number of new malware variants that are being created every day. And three 0.4 million is a global shortage of skilled security workers. So you can see that there's an uphill battle here for sure. After the break, who's responsible if you fall victim to a scammer? I was out on holiday in Abu Dhabi and I got a notification on my phone that my card had been used to try and book some flights with South African Airways. Obviously, I thought that was a little bit unusual given that I was on holiday. So they must have taken a picture or someone who must have seen my card details and then tried to plug it in online. Because when I called up my credit card company, um, it was American Express, they were really good and they managed to cancel everything. I wasn't charged or anything like that. They were also trying to make a booking through Booking.com or Trivago or something like that. They were trying to get a hotel as well, and they didn't manage to get through on that one. It was great that I had this, you know that feature on your phone where it says when you purchase something? I immediately called them and they sorted it out straight away. Adam, so now we know that a lot of people are getting scammed and a lot of money is being lost. So who pays for it? When somebody loses a bunch of money, who's on the hook? Well, who exactly pays and who's responsible varies a lot from country to country, but obviously no one wants to take all of the hit here. So basically what you have is a situation where there's lots of discussions and disagreement around where the responsibility lies. So it isn't a clear cut thing. Obviously, if you've been victim of a, if you know someone's stolen your credit card, they've copied it, the bank's pretty much going to you know, give you your money back in that kind of situation. Where it becomes a bit tricky is when you get tricked into making a payment. And that's where the responsibility is a little bit less clear. So obviously, in a lot of scams, you are almost by definition being tricked. So the difficulty then lies around how the bank determines what's happened during the process. And in places like the US and the UK, the onus is moving on to banks taking more responsibility to reimburse customers that have lost money through scams. But what we're seeing is a big change in, in this area and a lot of political capital now being spent on trying to hold a bigger group of organizations responsible. So not just banks, but also in some of these AI scams that are involving tech platforms, for example, there's an argument now that tech firms should have to stump up more for losses in this area as well. If you ask the banks, they'll tell you who's not paying, and that's big tech. And banks around the world are very vexed about this because they want big tech to be held more responsible for some of these scams that are being hosted on their sites. So Adam mentioned the investment scams, but also fake websites for online shopping, for example, that are popping up. And telecom companies or others that banks think should be doing more to help block numbers that are sending those phishing texts, for example, or those messages that they send where they say, you forgot to pay your toll, please click this link. They want telecom companies to disable those kinds of links and tackle the problem at its root. When are consumers on the hook to pay? I mean, that's the big question because consumers themselves so far, you know, we've been used to credit card, for example. Somebody steals a credit card, they use that to buy, I don't know, a thousand bubblegum machines or something somewhere and, you know, it wasn't you. And the bank says, okay, you can have your money back because we know that was fraudulent. So credit card fraud is unauthorized fraud because you haven't allowed that to happen. But right now, what we're seeing globally is that authorized fraud is actually surpassing unauthorized fraud. So that's where somebody has tricked you into giving up your money voluntarily. 
And in that instance, you know, so far, banks are still paying out to a large degree. But at some point, I guess, you know, they would really like consumers to take more responsibility. But it's very, very difficult because, you know, we've been saying how AI is making it so much harder to discern what is real and what is fake. Is it realistic to say that the tech companies should police this? Do they have the tools to do this and they're simply not doing it? Ultimately, this is about whether these firms want to spend more money, more time weeding out what's real and what isn't on their platforms. And of course, they can do it. There's varying degrees of how difficult that is to do it, but it requires more time and more resources and more staff. So ultimately, it costs more money. So it comes down to a simple equation on cost. Ultimately, if they want to spend more of their dollars on getting a grip on this, then that's one choice. The other choice is not to spend as much time and money on this. And that's another choice. When we come back, what can we do to protect ourselves? Adam, one thing you write about is that as the banks try to keep up with the scammers, the scammers are trying to stay one step ahead and change the way they do things. Yeah, there's a constant arms race going on here uh, between just a kind of a keeping a competitive edge. So as every kind of new technology evolves, of course, you're, you're trying to catch up and you're trying to kind of prevent the next thing from happening. But you're always catching up. You're always trying to kind of stay one step ahead of the game. But of course, they're typically a step or two behind the game and the scammers are the ones that are a step ahead. So it's a constant effort to try and to learn more, to understand what's going on with the latest technology and then to try and have a plan to fight back against it. But it's very clear from all the reporting that there's this sense of skepticism and this sense that this isn't something that's winnable. This is an arms race of technological innovation, really. And if the scammers are one step ahead with the technology, then they're going to continue to keep winning. So there were four of us reporting on this story around the world, and we all heard from our sources that it's just like Adam says, it's an arms race and it's hard to win, but also that they all have to now start pooling their resources a lot more. Banks and tech companies, they all have to band together because they just can't be as nimble as these scammers. You know, you shut down a scammer call center and another one pops up the next week. They're like big businesses, right? So a lot of these people we spoke to said, look, they're running a business too, and they're going for maximum profit. And unlike the banks, they're not bound by rules and regulations. So they're able to move a lot faster. And that's why the banks, it seems like they're just a step behind and trying to catch up. We touched a little bit on what governments are trying to do to get their arms around this. Adam, what kind of government regulation is in the works? Well, I think really what you need to see from governments is more of a coordinated action around how they're trying to tackle this. But of course, governments can only step in if the private sector is doing their utmost in a coordinated way to try and tackle this problem. And I think that's kind of what you're seeing now is that governments are trying to get the private sector to talk to each other. They recognize that this spans across different parts of the economy. It's not just banks or it's not just technology firms. It's a whole swathe of different companies that need to share information about how to tackle this together with governments if they're going to really tackle this and crack down on it. So I can imagine a lot of people listening to this podcast saying to themselves, oh, great. So If no one seems to know how to stop this, how am I supposed to protect myself from scammers when the technology is getting so good? I think we all can be a lot more vigilant and just tidier about how we handle ourselves on the internet. Just make sure that before you authorize any kind of payment to anybody that you don't know, that is not an immediate family member that's already in your log of accounts that you do send money to, just stop and check for a sec. It's very, very easy to fall victim to one of these scams. 
it's very, very easy to click that phishing email. In fact, I did it last week because I thought it was a work email. And as, as I went to click it, I thought, hang on a second. So I like shut down the <laughs> site before it loaded, but I did click on it. You know, it's just really easy to fall victim. So we all just have to be so hyper vigilant. That's the best way to do it and set up as many of those kinds of checks and balances for yourself as you can. You know, maybe only transfer money to accounts that are already vetted and that you already have in your address book. For example, you know, be careful when you're dealing with crypto exchanges and sending money over crypto. Nabila, Adam, thanks so much for coming on the show. Thanks, Wes. It's been really great. Thanks. It's been great to be with you. Thanks for listening to us here at The Big Take. It's a daily podcast from Bloomberg and iHeartRadio. For more shows from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen. And we'd love to hear from you. Email us questions or comments to bigtake at bloomberg.net. The supervising producer of The Big Take is Vicky Vergolina. Our senior producer is Catherine Fink. Federica Romaniello is our producer. Our associate producer is Zenob Siddiqui. Rafael Amsili is our engineer, with additional production support from Jill Namazzi. Our original music was composed by Leo Sidrin. I'm Wes Kosova. We'll be back tomorrow with another Big Take.